as we approach this Sunday, I was reflecting upon this last year, and a lot has changed. A lot has changed from we from the time we first launched till now. But the one thing that stands out to me the most is that the Lord is faithful. Amen. The Lord is faithful. We've gone through ups and downs, changes left and right, um, but the Lord is faithful. Another thing that has stood out to me over the last year is God's glory. And you'll see how that fits in. So we're going to look at God's faithfulness and God's glory this morning. I'm um, in the Old Testament over and over. The Lord's faithfulness, his character is talked about. And there's this cool Hebrew word called hesed. And it's repeated over and over and refers to God's character. And so as we live in a world of changes and many trials and many variables and stressors in our life, um, I want you to remember the Lord's character. I want you to remember that the Lord is a God of hesed. Hesed is found over 250 times in the Old Testament. Essentially, it was repeated re repeatedly, um, particularly to Moses. In the second, uh, second time, he described the Lord God described himself as one who is hesed, abounding, filled with love and faithfulness, an unfailing love, an un a faithful love, a steadfast love, a loyal love, found in Exodus chapter. 34 verses 6 and 7 which says the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord the Lord a God merciful and gracious slow to anger abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness keeping steadfast love for thousands forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin but will be excuse me but who will by no means clear the iniquity visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children and the children's children to the third generation and to the fourth generation so the core idea of hesed is idea that god is loyal he's faithful um he lavishes his faithfulness to generations upon generation. This is the same kind of picture that we understand God's love to be a covenantal love in the Old Testament. And I believe this same kind of covenantal love of faithfulness and love is seen also in the New Testament through the New Covenant. And so as I think about the Lord's faithfulness, um, I, I think of how he has been faithful to Rooted Church. And over and over, um, God shows his faithfulness. He's given us tons of promises in the Old Testament, and we see them fulfilled in the New Testament. The biggest one that we know is the Lord God promised in the Old Testament that a Messiah would come, and he came, and he'll come a second time. And so we can praise God for that. And so I just want to recount some of God's faithfulness. So we're going to see that God has been active at Rooted Church and, of course, in other places. But I just want to highlight some of these over the past year. In 2018, uh, Rooted Church began with a dream, an inkling, an idea of starting a, and planting a multi-ethnic, multicultural church here in the Triangle. Um, we know this is one of the fastest growing demographics in the triangle. We wanted to meet this need and serve the Lord in this way. And so at this early stage in 2018, it began with like 10 or 12 people. And so we prayed about this and we reached out and had a conversation with Stephen Davies, senior pastor at Colonial Baptist Church. And he said, would you consider partnering with us? And so a few months later into 2019, I, January 2019, that's the day I believe we had conception. And so we thought about having a baby, and then we had conception at that point. So I see that first four months at Colonial Baptist as our time of our first trimester. At that time, we were laying down foundation, we were laying down vision, mission, and core values, and this... <clears throat> trying to understand who we are as a church. During that season, we grew to about 30, 35 people. And then as the church grew, we moved to our, our, our second trimester, and that's when we moved here in May. Um, what we're thankful for this place, originally it was Santa Ruth Theater, and later it became Pure Life Theater. Um, and we're thankful for this place because we don't have to pay a ton for it. It's a nice place. It's central because our people are coming from where? Name the cities. Holly Springs. Holly Springs, right there. Apex. Apex, where? 
Carrie. Carrie, where else? Back there. Me? Yeah, where are you coming from? California. California. <laughs> Chapel Hill ish. Maybe. Yep. So, some people are coming north. Where are you guys coming from? Raleigh. Raleigh and Wake Forest. Some of you guys. Where are you guys coming from? Edie? Oxford. So people are coming from all over the place. And so we know this area is central to the freeway. And that's that was key um, to coming here. And so that's our second trimester. And then the Lord blessed us um, with charter members. Some of them are here. Who are charter members of this church? Okay. And then who are members of this church? All right. Some others. All right. So members started, we started, we established membership. Um, we had a group of three interns that came from Colonial Baptist Church. One of them is still here. And so Dylan has been a blessing. And that's all happened in the second trimester of this local church. And then <clears throat> according to church planting gurus, if you get around 40 people, it's time to get ready to launch. And so as we move toward launching, we had college outreach. We had Johnson Lake outreach. We had Dragon Festival outreach. We had two pre-services and then some sweat, some blood, some tears, some spending of money. And we launched, you guys know the date? October... 13th 2019 and then we celebrated Christmas and Thanksgiving and New Year's and things and Valentine's Day and some of us went to a parenting conference and um, and heard a trip preach um, in March and then what happened COVID. COVID seven months of COVID and the new normal um, COVID has been tough, it's been stressful, but I also think it's been good. It's helped us to understand who we are in Christ. It's helped us, I think it's kind of like fertilizer. For those who really love Christ, I think we cling to Christ even harder. For those who are kind of like onlookers or fair weather Christians, they probably are floundering around here and there. Um, but I think COVID has been good. It's, it's been a gut check for the church. And so that's COVID um, for you. I think. I think God is using COVID um, without a doubt to make us look to him more and more and cling to his gospel and to his word. And so I wanted to stop and just be reminded of God's faithfulness and just to see that he's been here up to this point. And, and today we're going to celebrate also with Al Potter. And also there's a couple new interns coming on board from Southeastern. And so we're just thankful. We're thankful for your friendship. We thank you. We're thankful for the people who've been there from the very beginning until today. We just thank you for your friendship and your partnership in the gospel. And most of all, we're thankful to God. God. We're thankful to Jesus. So let's say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You're so good. You're so faithful. And so my last point is I want to just remind you of an eternal perspective. Uh, my favorite preacher is you guys know my favorite preacher it's really the apostle paul um you guys probably had all these thoughts who my favorite preacher was but it's really the apostle paul and i find much encouragement as a young pastor it was always like i always thought about timothy and titus but now i'm a middle-aged pastor so i'm starting to think more in terms of paul and seeing his gospel spread through churches upon churches and seeing churches establish and plant other churches but i think of what we go through and what Paul goes through. And I, I've been thinking about what motivated him to keep on going. I know some of us are tired. I know some of us are sick of COVID. I know some of us may be feeling burnt out or just like, this is hard. And so I just wanted you to think of the hardest thing you're facing right now. The worst thing. Well, I don't know what that may be. But I want you to think about that and then think about this, okay? Just hold those worst things in your mind. We were not gonna, we're not going to dwell on them forever. But I want you to turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 17 and 18. And I want to encourage you big time here. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 through 18. We're going to look at Paul's perspective, at how he remained faithful to the faithful one when things were hard and when things were difficult. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. Paul says this, But we have this treasure in, in jars of clay. Okay, jars of clay or earthen vessels are, are baked clay pots. 
They're cheap, they're breakable, they're replaceable, but they also, um, held very practical functions in households. Sometimes they're used for vaults, sometimes they're used to put food in, sometimes they're used to put money in, jewelry in, and important documents. Sometimes they're used as a garbage can, and sometimes they were used for human waste, so old school toilet bowl, all right? Before they had our special toilet bowls, they had this kind of clay pot toilet bowl. And so I think as Paul is thinking about his life and himself, and when he says he is this clay pot, I believe he's really, excuse me, speaking of himself, he's lowly, he's common, he's expandable, he, he's replaceable. He didn't look at himself as Apostle Paul. I'm the irreplaceable Apostle Paul. He knew he was common. And there's a, a point that I believe that he's trying to draw out here. And we'll see it in the next verse, the last part of verse 7. But we have this common treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God, not us. The surpassing power belongs to God and not us. It is God's power through the gospel of Jesus Christ that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that raised every one of us from being spiritually dead to be spiritually alive in Christ if you're a born again believer. And today I'm thrilled to celebrate that with Elizabeth and also with Joe and others as the Lord tarries. And it is God's same power that saved us that also sanctifies us and transforms us and will also take us home one day. It is his power that will carry us through. It's an unbreakable change from election to glorification and everything in between that. That includes election to justification to sanctification to glorification one day. That chain can never be broken. When God initiates that, he will complete that with us. And so it is his power that God works out in common people like you and me. Originally, we're basically all dirt, right? That dust will, 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 will we return. It is not us. It is not our human power that will create this church. It is not our human effort that will build this church. It is by Christ alone. And so when Paul thinks and look at his life and all that he's going through, he says this in verse eight. We are afflicted in every way but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. And look really carefully in verses 11 and 12, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that, that's a hint of purpose clause, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. Verse 11, for we who live are always being given over to the death for Jesus, for Jesus' sake, so that, another hint of purpose clause, so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Hence, our vision. We want to be rooted in the gospel to reflect God's glory. And so as we go through every temptation, every trial, we have an opportunity to what? Glorify God or glorify our, ourselves. We could do that through fussing, angry, being whiny, or all kinds of stuff. But God gives us this opportunity as Christ works in and through us to glorify Him, to display Him in the heat, in the difficulties. And so as you think of the worst thing you're facing in your life, and then think now of Paul, and to think of the things that he faced in his life, and what encouraged him to press on. Come with me now to verse 16. He says this. So, <clears throat> so we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day, for this is momentary, excuse me, for this is light and momentary aff affliction, for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond comprehension. We do not look at the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transcendent, transcendent or temporary. 
but the things that are un unseen are eternal. So quick question. <coughs> What is this light momentary affliction? Okay, you think of the worst thing in your life. I don't know what it may be. You know, she's angry at me. I, my job is not what I hoped it to be. We're in conflict, we're fighting. Um, whatever it may be, I want you to see in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 28, that's seven chapters later, Paul gives a, a listing of the things he went through. And I want to ask, is anything you are going through compared to what Paul is going through? And so in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 says this, are they servants of the Lord? Am I a better one? Am I talking like a madman with far greater labors? Far more, imprisonments, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews, 40 lashes minus one, which is 39. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, that means with big rocks, not with drugs. Three times I was shipwrecked. And at night and day, I was adrift at sea, verse 26, on frequent journeys, in danger, in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger from the city, danger from the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toils and hardship, through many sleepless nights. I don't, I don't know how we get sleepless nights these days, watching too much TV. <laughs> I mean, I know certain many, certain internet things are just like we're watching videos to three, four, five o'clock at night up till sun rises these days. That's how we get our sleepless nights these days. Um, and going on, it says hunger. He also faced hunger and thirst, often without food. We call this cold exposure, 40 degrees, 45 degrees. I'm sure he faced much cold, colder exposure. In verse, verse 28, and apart from other things, the daily pressure on me, on Paul, was anxiety for all the churches. Um, earlier this week, I watched uh, a conference by Acts 29, and the main theme from that conference spoken to hundreds if not thousands of pastors was to remain faithful was to remain faithful in all this i had pastors call me this week saying gary i don't know what about my church we used to be 300 now we're 200 we used to be 100 now we're down to 25 people guys crying to me guys saying i think i'm going to quit and i'm just saying guys we got to remain faithful we need to support each other we got to do whatever we can to remain faithful i know members that are struggling with their faith struggling with their theology and my exhortation to you is to remain faithful because why what Paul faced and what you are facing today is momentary light affliction in comparison to the greater grain of Christ's glory to come one day in the future. You know, yesterday I was hoping that Apollos would win their tournament and that we would taste a little bit of human glory, but really that's this little bit of human glory. I want you to know that the pain that you're experiencing now and even more pain that you'll face is momentary light affliction in comparison to the gain that you'll receive in Christ one day for eternity. So I want to say it again. The pain now is nothing in comparison to the glory, the gain that you'll receive one day. Can we get an amen? Amen, man. That is so true. I mean, you might live 80 years, 100 years, maybe 105 years with a lot of pain and suffering, but that's nothing in comparison to the gain for all of eternity. I mean, that motivate us through this life until the end. Help us, Lord God, to remain faithful. Brother Al Potter, please come and help us in the next years to come. Take your Bibles, if you would, please, and come with me to the book of Acts in chapter 2 as we look to the Word of God together, as we look to the future of this ministry. And uh, let me say, as I get started this morning, uh, 
I bring you greetings from Colonial Baptist Church, and we want you to know that you are continuously, not only as a part of our support mechanism, but you're also continuously in our prayers and always there to be a help and an encouragement to what God is doing here through Rooted Church. And we are thrilled to see Rooted Church get to this place, and we are excited to see where Rooted Church is going to go from this place. And with that in mind, I, I kind of want to go back historically, not in your church's history, but in theological history, and be able to address it from Acts chapter 2, verse 42, down through verse 47, and use it kind of as a basis as to where rooted church can be in the future. You know, they say a church is only as good as what it is devoted to. Well, you can say that individually. Individually, we're only what we are in regard to our devotion. If you go back with me historically to the first century and go back to about 32 AD, we have the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. Now, you may have put it in 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33. That's about the variables of historical dating for the actual death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. For me, it's comfortable to get right in the middle and say 32 AD is when it all happened. But we do know what happened around it. We know that he was in the grave for three days and that he rose from the dead. And we know that after he rose from the dead, he was on this earth in his resurrected body for 40 days. Toward the end of those 40 days, if you remember, he met with his disciples around Jerusalem. And he gave them a challenge. He said, my challenge is that you are to go back into Jerusalem and you're to wait. And when the Holy Spirit comes, then he gave them the admonition of Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Well, then Jesus rose from the dead, and then Jesus ascended. Forty days later, he ascends to be with his father. So you only have seven days left for Pentecost to take place. So the disciples go into Jerusalem, and there they wait for seven days. At the end of the seven days, they have gathered in an area which was close to what they call Solomon's Porch. Solomon's Porch was a place where Solomon put forth his edicts as a king. But later it became a center of discussion. In fact, many discussions, even by Jesus, took place in Solomon's porch there in Jerusalem near to the temple area. The disciples, seven days after the ascension, received the Holy Spirit. There's a great gathering at Pentecost, which would have been 50 days from the Passover that Jesus was crucified at. Now we're in position historically for the beginning of the first church that was ever established. The Bible tells us only 120 people gathered for those seven days in Jerusalem. I'm not saying there weren't other individuals who had come to know the Lord Jesus Christ in his ministry years. There probably were. But at least in the city of Jerusalem at this time where the first church would begin, there was 120 that gathered. And if you remember the history of it, they gathered and Peter preached a great sermon. At the end of his sermon, the Bible tells us in verse 41 of Acts chapter 2, 3,000 individuals turned to Christ. The Bible says those 3,000 were baptized. The Bible says those 3,000 were added. Added to what? Well, they were added to the 120. Now, there's great theory of church growth right there. From 120, here was a church that advanced to 3,120. In a few months, 5,000 men will get saved. Imagine that. In a matter of months, the first church that was established started with 120, grew to 3,120, and before you could blink an eye, they were at 8,120. But it's not numbers that defined that church in Jerusalem. Not numbers at all. In fact, some would say that the church in Jerusalem grew 
By the time it was persecuted and scattered to almost 50,000 individuals that made the Jerusalem church their home up to the time of their eventual persecution and being scattered. If growth in numbers did not make that church, then what defined it? And by that, what should define the rooted church? Or define Colonial Baptist, where I serve as a pastor? What is it that defines a church? What defines the church is what it is devoted to. And the future of rooted church will be more based on what it's devoted to than it will be based on the numbers, even if those numbers, if we could even imagine, could be developed along the line of that first church there in Jerusalem. Here we find four devotions, and I challenge you as a church to make these your devotions, not only personally, but as a body of believers as well. Would you notice that in verse 42, the Bible tells us in that first church that they continued steadfastly or they continued in their devotion. First of all, it says to the apostles doctrine. Here was a church, if I could put it this way, that was devoted to theology. Theo, God, ology, the study of words, or literally the study of words about God. The term here is teaching, or you may have in your translation the word doctrine, or we reference it simply as theology, a general term that identifies all the theological teachings that are found in the Word of God. A church devoted to theology. You know, we live in a world that surrounds us with a devotion to certain isms. Isms like secularism. Isms like humanism. Isms like relativism. Isms like materialism. Well, then what is our answer to that? Especially in essence of what Paul will say in Romans chapter 12, when he says that we are not to live in conformity to this present age, where these isms particularize the society. But he says, we are to live by a transformation of our minds. That is, the child of God no longer thinks like the world. Therefore, a church in its devotion no longer symbolizes the isms of the world, but it has developed a brand new form of thinking. That thinking is our devotion to theology. And that theology is the study of words concerning God. Or we could put it simply this way. It's the word of God. Here was a church that continued steadfastly. That is, in essence, this church said truth will always matter to us. The second devotion this church had was it cherished the church as a family. See, it doesn't only say that they were devoted to the apostles' doctrine or teaching. As we think of truth mattering, it said the church is a family matter because it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' fellowship, the koinonia. You see, there is a horizontal relationship that we find in the church because the church is built upon a premise of assembling. And that assembling identifies who we really are. We find relationship one with another. Is it any wonder, and, and I take that kind of a thought of, of assembly, and if you ever studied that in the book of Hebrews, what is it, chapter 10, where he says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, he says, and all the more, he says, what? In spite of COVID. He says, and all the more as the day of Christ approaches, we will need this, this horizontal fellowship, this horizontal relating. We will need it all the more as the day approaches. Well, if you wonder why, look at the four or five verses that precede that in Hebrews chapter 10. They're all responsibility realities we have to each other as family. You see, the uniqueness of each and every one of us 
is that we have something in common if you're a Christian. You're in Christ. And the Bible says that we as a people are to be devoted to this family. Not only devoted to theology, but devoted to this family. Now, that is probably why Paul, remember when he writes 1 Corinthians, and we've heard a little bit from Corinthians already, but when he's writing 1 Corinthians, you remember he comes to, what is it, the 12th chapter, and he gives us this thing toward the end of the 12th chapter. He says, desire the greatest of the gifts. That's the first thing he says. But then he makes a statement. But he says, I'm going to show you a more excellent way. He said, desire the greatest of the gifts. And all you got to do is work backwards in chapter 12 from that statement at the end. And you'll find out what are the greatest of the gifts. Because he uses a Greek numerical adjective to define the great ones and then the lesser ones. He says, desire the greatest of the gifts. But then he says, I'm going to show you a more excellent way. And then you come into chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians. And you have that list from verse 1 all the way to verse 8 of all the definitive ideas that are centered around the subject of love. Every one of them are built on that Greek word agape, the highest form of love that can be known and experienced by a human being because it only comes as a gift from God. But he defines it from chapter, from verse 1 all the way to verse 8 in the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. And then he comes down there and he says, you know, we see through a glass darkly. You know, we were this, we were that and all that. And then he concludes the 13th chapter by making a statement. He says, but now. He gets into the present tense. He says, now abides this and this only. Faith, hope, love. And the greatest of these is love. He said, this is what abides now. He says to that Corinthian church, and keep in mind, he's helping the Corinthians come to a conclusion to understand when their carnality stopped and their spirituality started. Because remember, they were a carnal church. And he said, it will be seen when these three abide, faith, hope, and and love. Not only are they vertical in their experience, but you know they are horizontal in their experience. Is it any wonder that in the first church their devotion was not just to theology, but their devotion was to each other? They continued steadfastly or in their devotion, not only to the apostles' doctrine, but they continued in it in the relationship to the apostles' fellowship, into the relationship as being a body of Christ. There's a third devotion, and that is here is a church that was devoted to God. You know, you can be an organization and leave God out, but here the Bible says they continued in prayers and in breaking of bread, and later on, you'll say, down in the 47th verse, he says, they will also continue in their praising of God. They understood and they comprehended that they were different from any other organization, any other structure, anything else in town. They understood that their existence was a reliance upon the sovereign God of the universe. They understood it because of their theology. They understood it because of the uniqueness of their fellowship. And so even in that context, their devotion was not simply to Peter who brought the great message that day. Their devotion was to God. You see, uniquely saying it, we are a unique organization in the sense that we're not just an organization. We're an organism. We're actually alive. And what makes us alive is the Spirit of God. And our devotion to God brings life to us as a church. We're not just a business. We're not just a nation. We're even more unique. We're actually breathing and alive because of the sovereign God who brought us into existence. So we come together to worship God. We come together to exalt his name, to understand him in his being, in his triunity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
but we have that essence of devotion to God. So we see a devotion to theology. Truth matters. We see a devotion to each other. Family matters. We see a devotion to God. Let's say it. God matters. But there's a last devotion in this church. And we find it in the 47th verse where it says, And the Lord added to the church daily such as were being saved. We're also devoted to our community, to the lost, to those who know not the Savior. That is, the cry of the newborn babe in Christ ought to be heard often. Our desire and our thirst is to take this marvelous word of God and present it to those who know not the Christ. To take it into our communities, to take it into our neighborhoods, to take it into our places where we go to school, to take it where we work and to share who Christ is with them. And the Lord will add daily such as he sees fit to the church. And so the Lord did that for this church. In essence, we would say if truth matters, if the church is a family matters, if God matters, then we have to conclude as well that the lost matter. In fact, did you know that all of us at one time were lost? And if we wouldn't have mattered, we would not have become believers. But there's a danger in our day. The danger is that we are so sheltered that we have now made our churches castles and the world around us only knows that we exist because every once in a while we throw a rock over the wall. When in reality, we ought to be going out from the castle. I remember one time I was preaching in a church and when you left the church, I had on the door as you left out, you are now entering the mission field. Amen. You know, we are to go everywhere sharing the gospel. Isn't it interesting that Jesus seven days before the establishment of the church when he ascended said in Acts chapter one, verse eight, that we are to be witnesses. In fact, I believe the Greek word there is martyr. Even unto death. Where? He said in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the world. We are to be witnesses. So as I look to your future, my prayer is that this church will maintain its devotion to theology, because truth matters. Will maintain its devotion to each other, because the church is a family matters will maintain its devotion to God because God matters and will maintain its devotion to the lost because the lost, they matter. So that's my challenge as you look to your future, that God would build your devotion and that you would fulfill it until the day that Jesus comes again. Amen, Gary. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Potter. <laughs>
the hope that Christ Jesus brings. And so what concretely that means is when we volunteer with them, we provide food and meals and prayer and a message that Christ Jesus brings. And so I really encourage all of us to be involved as a way of you know, living our third part of the mission to engage our cities. And so last fall, um, a big group of us went and um, to the community that we were assigned to. We were assigned to 1500 Millbanks Road, and so that's in the northeast part of uh, Raleigh. And they have a really interesting operation. So they're split into many different small groups. Some groups went out and knocked on doors and helped pray for people. Uh, other groups uh, gave out food. Other groups um, worked with the kids, played basketball. And at the end, there was this big storytelling um, part where all the kids got together and a, and a community member came out and really talked about how you know he came out of the community and really rose up and believed in Christ and how his salvation came and so um, even yeah at the end of it actually Natalie and I sort of talked with this lady for almost 20 minutes it was longer than I hoped but you know she told me almost her story her her life and she had this sense of sense of peace and contentness that I feel, you know, even some of us don't really have. And so, I don't know, it was really interesting just meeting people of different walks of life and um, just, you know, listening to their stories and praying with each other. And so um, with COVID that has become a little different. And so they're looking for small groups of, you know, three people. Um, there's many different types of opportunities. Um, there's places in food warehouses on Fridays. There's um, small groups every other Saturday. That's what they do. And there's also, um, they partner with Wake Community um, Schools to help give out meals uh, almost every day. So Monday through Friday, I think 12 to 1, 1 to 2. Uh, they're giving out meals to uh, kids who are, who are still at home um, and, you know, don't have an alternative way of getting meals. And so those are different ways uh, we can partner with Raleigh Dream Center, and I just want to encourage all of us to start thinking of how we can sort of be together and live out our third part of our mission. Um, so we'll be working with uh, our different growth groups in the next few months and just figuring out how this works. And so reflecting what Al Potter said, I really think this is a way of being sent out, you know, and as Jesus said, one big theme of the gospel was sending people out and so not being just in your communities. And, you know, he not only sent out the disciples, but he himself went to all these different communities and wasn't just in one area and having people come to him, he went out to all these different communities. And so we were called to sort of live in the same way. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. Oh.